Well, we only saw the first slide. But that's what she showed. That's what she showed. So it's okay. So Not from the started, beginning. She started the second slide. No, she had the one. Oh, she had, you know, with the definition of new religious groups, which was converts. Da, 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 da. Okay. 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 Well, it still isn't working properly, but I'll try. Are you now seeing converts? Yes, yes, we see converts. Good. Yes. Well, my see. argument here is that new religious movements do sometimes have um, a predisposition towards violence or certain factors that might predispose them with being in tension with society. And um, this can lead to violence. If you define new religious movements, as I like to do for research purposes, as movements, religions with first generation membership. And that means they're converts, of course, by definition. And converts tend to be far more enthusiastic and wanting to do something with their religion than people who've been born into a religion, generally, very generally speaking. Also, they tend to be atypical of the general population. And that might mean that the, they, they belong to a group, say, young, enthusiastic people with no um, dependents or people who feel so deprived that they've nothing really worth living for that could um, make violence a way out, apparent way out. Charismatic founders or leaders aren't accountable to anyone except perhaps God, but they may say they are God. Um, and they're not bound by rules or tradition in the way that other leaders might be. They very often have a dichotomous worldview, which sees things in terms of being godly and satanic or sort of um, good and bad and no grays, no on the one hand, on the other hand, and less likelihood for dialogue. They tend to be treated with suspicion by the rest of society for obvious reasons if something new comes along. Um, they're, they're not sure about it. And uh, so that, that, that tension may exist just because they are new. And they do tend to change far more rapidly and radically than older religions do. And this means that um, after a certain stage, the, these particular um, characteristics where they do exist, cease to exist with the second, third and subsequent generations. But then there are also various other aspects which make large, old, new religious movements um, in a far better position to be successfully violent. Um, they'll have more strength, uh, more numbers, more political um, power and so on. Um, there have been various attempts at classifying the um, different new religious movements. Um, Brian Wilson's, for example, um, talking about new religions, mainly 19th century set. And he divides them into a number of different categories, which the revolutionists are the ones which are most likely to be violent. Um, but he says that the revolutionists are just a potential for violence. They, they, they need not be revolutionary in the violent sense at all. Some of them would expect God to see to it. Um, and also, if they're revolutionary, because they think they've got a a role in leading to Armageddon and the end of the world, then this dies out after a short time if the dates aren't met. It's difficult to um, go on uh, believing in that way. Um, he, um, well, to move next to Roy Wallace, he had three kinds of new religions and the world rejecting movement was the one that he thought was um, most liable to be violent. And you will see if you read his book um, on, on the um, different types of new religions, 
but the ones that he see, says fall into this category. Very many of them are now later and um, in second, third generations and would change the category. They don't fit the categories that he had for them when he was writing back in the 1980s. And then Kathy Wessinger um, also has looked at millennial religions and the different ways in which um, they may be violent. Um, the targets of violence vary enormously and the people to suffer most at the hands of new religions are, I suspect, their own members. Um, they, they, there's quite a lot of talk about how badly they've been treated and often with violence in the, in the new religions. Uh, if you go to any of the anti-cult meetings, you'll hear lots and lots of stories about that. Um, <clears throat> how far one can generalize from that is, of course, another matter. But there, there do seem to be a lot of cases where it's inward-looking violence. And then there are the former members um, or um, people who are known to the membership um, personally their, their um, relatives or, or, or people like that, or the anti-cultists, perhaps. Um, there are a lot of stories that you hear in the movements about why, how when people have left, um, terrible things have happened to them, um, which again may or may not be true. Then there's what I'm calling a selected caste class of persons who are considered the enemy. And these may be politicians or the police or lawyers or scientific experiments, people using animals, for example, or um, anti-abortionists. And then what happens, I think, least are random members of the population. Um, there you've got um, Om Shinrikyo would be a, an obvious example, but there, there are others where people are killed um, just because the, the, there wants to be a statement of violence of some kind. And then, as Jim has been pointing out in um, considerable detail, the movements themselves are often the target of violence. Now, who starts or instigates the violence? Um, very often it's just, oh, well, it was this movement or that movement which was responsible. But there are a lot of different ways in which this responsibility um, can be laid. The violence may be part of the new religion's policy, um, with the leader initiating the general idea that leads to the violence, and then you get officers who plan the tactics of how it should be carried out. And then the foot soldiers might carry out the deed. But quite often, foot soldiers don't know what's going on. Om Shinrikyo, for example, most of the foot soldiers had no idea about what um, Ashahara had been up to. Then you get individuals who, because of their belief, as they understand it, will commit violence. But it isn't a generally accepted um, policy of, of the religion. Um, and you might count here some of the um, people who kill um, abortionists uh, as an example. Um, you have an individual member who does something, but the violence has nothing to do with the new religious movement and which may, may be in clear opposition to, to um, the, the policy, if it is a policy of violence. And here, here you would have, for example, child abuse that goes on. This may be dead against the beliefs of the movement, the official beliefs, but individual members who belong to the group carry it out, and therefore the group is blamed. Um, sometimes the perpetrator is shielded by the religion um, and or may not be shielded and the religion may or may not punish 
the perpetrator of the violence. And there are cases where there's a lot of discussion about whether the perpetrator should be reported to the authorities um, by the new religions. Again, examples would be um, child abuse, Jehovah's Witnesses, for example. And then, as my last type of perpetrator, you've got leaderless resistance, um, the lone wolves. These are small, autonomous cells. Um, they may be just one person, a unabomber like Tent um, Krasinski, who carry out, they may be influenced by things like the Turner di um, Diaries or going to um, gun fairs or what have you. But um, they're, they're doing their own thing. And now for the types of methods that may be used. Um, there are lots of these, but just to name some of the more obvious ones, poisoning, like Osho did in Rajneeshpur, and putting sal um, salamella, sal uh, sal what's the word? Poisoning on the salad. Um, People's Temple and Heaven's Gate um, had some poisoning. Knifing by the Manson family, beheading by ISIS, um, shooting Jonestown, the people who didn't commit suicide, there were quite a few bodies found with bullets in them. Arson, the movement for the restoration of the Ten Commandments of God. The members there, a lot of them were put inside a church which was locked and then set fire to the burn lynching by the Ku Klux Klan, crucifixion by the Convarsarians, um, and they did all sorts of other nasty things to themselves. Bombing, the Oklahoma bombing, vehicle ramming like we had on the London Bridge, just driving a van down and killing as many people as possible. Um, the perpetrators sometimes use their own bodies to carry out violence on others by beating, strangling, or suffocating the victim. And um, the um, Om Shinrikyo uh, carried out all these methods, some of their members. Suicide bombers, ISIS self-immolation, and undermaga, um, <clears throat> weapons of mass destruction, as Sahara is the one that is um, the sarin gas in the Tokyo underground. Um, the Oklahoma bombing was said to be um, uh, 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 an example of a weapon of mass destruction. Um, so it depends how widely you define it. Uh, putting a four foot rattlesnake in a um, letterbox of a lawyer by Synanon. A cyber attack. Um, I've heard rumors of cyber attacks being carried out by um, one of the new religions, but I've no idea if it's true. Eric, who's here, might be able to help us on that. And drones and so on, you can go on. Now, there are also the different traditions, all the traditions practically. Um, I can't find any for the Jains, but... Um, <clears throat> that the most of the traditions do give rise to new religions which carry out violence. Uh, most often mentioned are the Islamic traditions, ISIS, the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, which we heard about today, al Mujahirun, the um, MEK. Um, there are lots of them which are more or less affiliated with each other. Um, Eastern traditions we go back to the um, Rajneesh um, forum that I mentioned when they put poison on the salad bar to try and stop people voting in local elections and getting power. Um, Ananda Marga, who's the Sydney Hilton bombing, who was meant to be killing the Indian prime minister because their leader was imprisoned, but actually it just killed two garbage collectors and a policeman. 
they, they carried out various other um, acts of violence as well. Um, Ketanananda Swami Bhaktipada, he was um, ISKCON, the Hare Krishna leader in New Vrindavan, and he, he ordered the, carrying, um, the killings of um, at least a couple of people. And after being threatened, it was very difficult to prove that he was involved. He didn't convict, the, he didn't um, carry out the actual murders. Um, the murderer was convicted. Um, but the, 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 they did do a sort of Al Capone thing and it, accuse him for um, financial ill dealings, and he went to prison for that for some time. Um, Om Shinrikyo, the sarin gas, when 12 were killed and several hundred injured, and various other things that they did. African traditions, I've already talked about the movement for the restoration of the Ten Years of God. This was defined as a Catholic order, though um, it, it um, what, what wasn't generally accepted. Um, the Lord's Resistance Army um, started off as the Holy Spirit movement with Alice Laquena, uh, who told her followers that they would be protected from bullets by holy oil or water. Um, and then later it became the Lord's Resistance Army under Joseph Coney. Um, <clears throat> They, they were a sort of Christian and indigenous, as well as national political uh, in their beliefs, and they employed quite a few child soldiers. Boko Haram, we've already heard quite a lot about that, so I won't say anything more. And also there are various beliefs in kinds of witchcraft, child witchcraft in particular, but not only. And a lot of violence has been meted out to um, children and sometimes they've been cut up and their uh, body parts used for rituals. We, we had a couple of cases of that in London. And then the Christian tradition, perhaps one of the most horrific examples was the Manson family, when not Manson himself, but his followers were persuaded by Manson to carry out the brutal killing of the pregnant actress. Sharon Trait and various others in 1969. And there's the Army of God, which is sort of rather loose Christian um, movement, uh, which is against the legalizing of abortion. And a couple of people at least have carried, who were connected with the Army of God, have carried out murders of doctors who have been carrying out um, abortions in, in Florida. Uh, the Church of the Lamb of God, um, Mike Homer talked about the doctrine of the blood atonement yesterday. So I won't go into that, but I, I think it was um, Susan who asked the question about Herbal LeBaron and um, that movement, new religious movement, um, <clears throat> from one of the 400 plus schismatic splinters of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, how um, Evan the Baron was responsible for dozens of murders. Um, Ludwig Philadelphia is a Swedish uh, Pentecostal movement. It's where well, it was not much more than a community, um, but it a Christian community in Sweden, not far from Uppsala. And there's a complicated um, system, which I won't go into, but the senior pastor persuaded his former mistress to kill his wife. Um, that is the senior pastor's wife and the husband of his present lover. Um, the husband of the present lover survived, but his wife died. And afterwards they found that the senior pastor's first wife, this was his second wife, but still, um, had died under rather suspicious circumstances. Um, then we've got the Ku Klux Klan, 
which has appeared at various stages um, as kind of Christian white Protestants in response originally to the anti-slavery legislation in the second half of the 19th century in America. The Oklahoma bombing, which um, Stuart has written a book on. Um, now, I want to bring up World Peace and Unification Sanctuary Church because it's in the news quite a lot. This is the splinter group or schism set up by the youngest of Sun Myung Moon's, um, the founder of the Unification Church, the Moonies. The, this is the youngest son set up this, and he's got a lot of publicity because he, you can see here, he's got a, a bullet crown and a golden um, gun here, and his <coughs> followers take guns to some of their conferences. I, I visited them for a couple of services, services I meant. Um, they didn't turn up with any guns on those ones, but they do. Now, and he's written a book called The Rod of Iron. Um, in many ways, it um, overlaps with the people that um, Stuart Wright was talking about yesterday. Um, but they have not committed any violence. They're very peaceful, and their argument is that if they have their rods of iron, their rifles, and they're all well-trained, that is the way in which they keep peace. Um, now, very quickly, if I can, I just want to dash through some of the violence against new religious movements. There's been, ever since, well, time immemorial, the early Christians and the Cathars, for example, Jehovah's Witnesses in Auschwitz because they refused to kill anybody, a lot of them died. Um, the Branch Davidians and the Waco, in the press, this is often presented as though they were the people who were responsible for this. But um, I, I think Nancy Anwerman and lots of other people um, who studied it would think that it was the ATF and the FBI that were responsible. Um, the move in Philadelphia, this was when nearly 500 police officer, officers um, with over 10,000 rounds of ammunition, uh, attacked the Moves House in Philadelphia and um, then bombed it with a police helicopter, dropped two one-pound bombs, killing 11 Move members and five of their children and destroying a whole lot of the nearby houses. People had been removed from there before the bombs were dropped. Yolanda Margis were beaten to death then set on fire. Um, Falun Gong, and we've always also had forced organ harvesting mentioned by Bernadette just now. This is a case where deprogramming has led to the death of some of the people who have been kidnapped and deprogrammed. Anyway, to conclude, most new religious movements do coexist with the rest of society without being noticed and are not um, by the rest of society and they're not directly affected by their presence. However, a few new religions do commit horrific acts of violence, as have almost all the older traditional religions. And when they do engage in violence, they're likely to be noticed in the media and given prominence so that people think cults, um, as they call them, and violence is almost the defining characteristic. Sometimes the violence is initiated by the new religion. And sometimes it's initiated by its opponents. But frequently it develops into a polarizing spiral. You get what um, criminology <laughs> is amplification. There are vast differences in manifestations of violence, both by and against new religions, as far as their traditions, targets, methods, and perpetrators are concerned. But many more new religions express a yearning for peace and have tried in their own diverse ways to achieve it. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, after this horrific panorama, I don't know if, if we have uh, enough time to to continue the discussion. Well, we have to hurry, but there might be one question. Yeah. One, one or two questions? No, no more? No, I, I don't really have a question, but I want to thank Eileen for a wonderful presentation and for the patience with the technology, which leads us to a time when we should uh, leave the room, uh, as Bernadette. Uh, so it's not that you don't have a question because it was not interesting, but because uh, we will be kicked out of the room in the next uh, few minutes. So we just want to thank you for your wisdom and patience. Yes, thank you Eileen, but the staff has already left and so we need to lock the room. Some of our technicians, I believe, have a spare key, but I think they want to, uh, to go to. So thank you for making it to the conference. Can I just say, Bernadette, yeah? that um, this was taken from a 14,000 word uh, paper that I've written and it, it was um, also describes the piece of the new Okay. Piece of the, would like the details of the just email me, I think. Okay. So. I will tell people, yeah. Eileen, you have heard, she suggests that if we want the text, she can send it to us. Yes, thank you, Eileen, because you closed the conference. It was a very, we don't, <laughs> Eric was asking me, my, my friend who is chairing, if we had concluding remarks, but <laughs> we skip concluding remarks for the whole conference. And now I wish peace to everybody, because after all, uh, it's the last word of the title of the conference, Religion, War and Peace. And uh, I invite everybody, but of course, those who are distant cannot come, but of course to join us tonight for dinner. So sorry Eileen, but we will have a lovely French dinner. <laughs> and I will see you on the 17th of November, remember, because I'm coming to your place. Normally, if there are no strikes in Britain, no strikes in France, uh, and virtu not virtually, but in person, okay? And I send you a big kiss, okay? Thank you so much. Bye bye, bye bye, bye bye. Bye bye. And uh, thank you to all the crowd that has remained until the very end. And peace be with you. <laughs>